Hi, I'm Carl Magnus Palm. I'm the author of Bright Lights, Dark Shadows, The Real Story of ABBA, published by Omnibus Press. This is the voyage of ABBA, five songs that led to Waterloo and beyond. Schlager music was a really, really important influence for, for ABBA. Um, in, in Sweden, it means, you know, you've got this German type Schlager kind of oompa boompa, German military marches kind of songs. And then you have the French chanson as well, and uh, Italian folk ballads, and Swedish folk music and things like that combined to, um, uh, to create a type of music that was mainly based on melody and uh, the kind of European tradition of music which doesn't uh, contain so much um, jazz or rhythm and blues. And one example of that is uh, Vildanden's song, the song of the wild duck. Uh, which was a, a hit in 1952 for a singer called Tori Banhaj in Sweden. And it was one of those songs that really made an impression on the young Bjorn Ulvaeus. Um, he told me, uh, he remembered, you know, running around in, in the summer listening to this song. This song was a hit and he, he thought it was so unbearably sad. And I think that sadness obviously carried forward to uh, the ABBA years and the type of songs that ABBA often wrote. Um, and it was the same for Benny Anderson, of course. He, he grew up with that kind of music as well. And some of those old songs, more, you know, folk songs or, or whether they were, you know, Schlager ballads or what, whatever, um, they still, some of those songs still go straight into his heart. Um, you know, even though they were, he first heard them like 60 years ago or something, or 70 years ago even. Uh, growing up in Sweden in the 1950s and then entering into their teens, you know, um, on the cusp of the 1960s, as both Bjorn and Benny did, obviously they were influenced by other things as well. You know, everyone loved Elvis, for instance, and uh, there was this musical tradition or musical genre, I should say, in the 1950s that was uh, called skiffle uh, originating in the uk you could say you know influences from american folk music and that kind of thing uh with lonnie donegan and you know everyone uh, the the beatles members for instance they formed uh, the f their first band was a skiffle band and you know the rhythm was provided by by a washboard and you had tea chest basses so very simple kind of things um and Bjorn was in one of those bands, and then that uh, morphed into a Dixieland band because that was also a, th a very popular thing, that kind of old style jazz in the late 50s, early 60s. Then, of course, everything changed when the Beatles came on the scene and the 60s exploded with all these influences from, from America and uh, Great Britain. Um, and one of the big influences, of course, was, you know, um, the Beatles are writing their own songs. Maybe I could try that as well. That's a thought that, that Bjorn had. And one of, you know, he wrote some early songs in the mid-60s for the Hootenanny Singers. They're not well known today, but I have one of them that I really uh, uh, like from that time is called In Thoughts of You, which has a really, really beautiful melody. Um, and it just proves that even at this stage he had a talent for songwriting and it was a similar thing going on with with Benny who was also influenced by this thing of writing your own songs um, like Lennon and McCartney did he also had this oh maybe I could write my own songs and he so he started in the mid 60s and had some really really huge hits for the Hepstars, uh, the band that he was in at the time uh, with his own song. So he was, they were both, uh, you know, uh, prolific and active songwriters uh, by the time they met in the mid 60s. In terms of 
life stories, perhaps the most interesting and intriguing member uh, of ABBA is Frida, who uh, you know had a very dramatic background. Her father was a German soldier in the occupying forces in Norway in uh, World War II. Her mother was a teenage girl um, and her father just disappeared very early on. She never, she, she never saw him as a child. Her mother died when Frida was less than two years old. She and her grandmother moved to Sweden to make a new life for themselves. And um, she grew up in, you know, in poverty. It wasn't like she was starving, but it wasn't, she, they weren't well off. Her grandmother had to take whatever work she could get to, to make ends meet. But for Frida, the thing, the big thing in her life, even as a child, was music. You know, she once said, I, I didn't start singing, I always sang. So that was, she found comfort and stability and uh, purpose in life through music. She started singing with the dance band when she was 13 years old. And um, she had a bit of a breakthrough in the, in the late 1960s through a talent contest. She made a television debut uh, on the same night that she won the talent contest, but she never really she never really connected with the with audiences because she was she had a background in jazz and uh, you know old american standards things like that so she wasn't that kind of perky happy jolly singer that um, swedes preferred at the time but in the in 1969 she met uh, Benny and struck up a relationship with him and after a year or so, well actually the same year, in 1969, he started producing her records. Um, um, initially unsuccessfully still, but in 1971 she recorded a song called Min Egen Stad, which Benny produced and uh, Bjorn and Agneta uh, sang backing vocals on and that went to number one on a radio chart in Sweden, which is very important, it's called Svensk Top, and it's based on votes, very popular radio show. So that was really the first time that she experienced real success as a recording artist. Um, and you know, it was so she had a really difficult start with this, but her love for music never wavered and sort of took her into the next phase of her career, which was ABBA, of course. So, by the early 70s, all four ABBA members were really not working in, shall we say, modern pop like English language, that kind of thing that was kind of more rock oriented. They were working in Schlager and more folky stuff and that, that, that appealed to uh, a middle of the road audience, let's say. Uh, but Bjorn and Benny and ABBA's manager, Stig Anderson, who was a really dynamic person and who would never take no for an answer, they had this dream that they could conquer the world with Swedish pop music, in English of course, uh, which no one had really done prior to that. No one was interested in, in, in Swedish pop music. So anyway, uh, Bjorn and Benny, they wrote a song called People Need Love and they felt, you know, we, should, we could actually do this as a duet with, with uh, the ladies. Um, so, you know, Bjorn and Benny sang a line uh, Agneta and Frida sang a line, that kind of thing, and then they joined together uh, on the choruses. So on a March day in 1972, they went to Stockholm's Metronome Studio, which was like the top studio in Sweden at the time, and they recorded this song. They released it about a month later, and it became a hit. Not a huge hit, but nevertheless a hit. And that was... Um, that was like the first step for them to to get some kind of acknowledgement that the four of us that's you know we can do good things together and the interesting thing with with people need love is their influence their main influence there was a group called blue mink who had some you know quite big hits in great britain in the late 1960s and early 70s and it's you know kind of very not very challenging pop music, kind of middle of the road pop music, 
slightly rocky, but not really. And that was where ABBA saw themselves at the time. They weren't influenced by, you know, Philly Soul or uh, progressive rock or sing-songwriter type material, whatever else was going on in the early 1970s. They saw themselves as a middle-of-the-road act, but that was the first step. And that's what sort of opened the door for them to continue recording as a group. So now it's January 1973 and Bjorn and Benny and Stig Anderson, who is their manager and the head of their record label Polar Music and also uh, their lyricist for many of their songs, they have been invited to the Swedish heats of the Eurovision Song Contest. It's called Melodi Festival and translates as the Melody Festival. They have been invited to submit a song for that, uh, for those Swedish heats. And they go out to this island in the Stockholm archipelago uh, called Vigsa, where they all have summer houses and where Bjorn and Benny have um, a songwriting cottage. So they, they sit down there with a piano and acoustic guitar, Bjorn and Benny do, and they come up with this song called Ring Ring. Uh, or rather it wasn't called that until Stig Anderson got his hands on it and he knew okay this is going to be a Eurovision song this is a song for the entire world we can't have like a really complex title it, it has to be understandable to everyone in whether it's in the Netherlands or on Iceland or wherever else so he he liked that kind of title that everyone could understand so ring ring yeah fine oh it's about a phone call someone's waiting for the phone to ring great um, he put together the lyrics for that and then uh, Bjorn and Benny and Agnes and Anifried, still not called ABBA, calling themselves by their first names, went into the studio to record this song. And before they did that, um, Bjorn and Benny had a discussion with their sound engineer, Michael, Michael B. Tretto, who was an employee at the Metronome studio where this was going to be recorded. And he had recently read a book by an author called Richard Williams, who was also, you know, a melody maker journalist. And he had written a book about Phil Spector, Out of His Head, uh, it was called, which is one of those classic uh, uh, rock biographies and maybe the major uh, Phil Spector biography. And he had found this book and, he, you know, he'd always wondered, how did Phil Spector get that sound? And he thought he had a hunch and then he sat down and and leafed through this book and read it and then you know it confirmed everything he thought yes it sounds like five guitars because it is five guitars it sounds like three pianos because it is three pianos and I thought wow we must try that and he's he told this story to Bjorn and Ben he said yeah 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 they were really excited about that as well let's try that uh, we, we'll do that on Ring Ring uh, the only thing was this is a Swedish recording session, early 1970s. They couldn't possibly afford three grand pianos or three or five guitar players, you know, at the same time. So uh, Michael came up with this idea. Well, let's just record it once, the backing track with all these instruments. Record it once and then we record the same thing twice. Again, overdub it. And that way you will get this, this sense of a lot of instruments. And uh, Bjorn and Benny, yeah, 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 sure, sure, let's do that. That's great. And then Michael did something that he didn't tell them that he was going to do. And that was he changed the speed of, of the tape recorder between the, the overdubs just slightly. But that when you do that, it, it gets just slightly out of tune. Not so you notice it, but it widens the sound. It becomes big, it becomes huge. So he did that. And you know, like he told me, it was like the roof was caving in and he can still remember how the hair stood up on his arms when they did that. It was such a new thing. And Bjorn and Benny were so excited. And this was, this was really groundbreaking for, for a Swedish recording. So you could say that this is the birth of the ABBA sound. This is where they're the, the first step to realizing what, what you can do when you have lots and lots and lots of layers of sounds on top of each other, which became an ABBA trademark eventually. 
Um, and going back to this thing with simple concepts like Ring Ring, uh, that's a good song title because everyone can understand it. What people might have a bit of a problem with is a group called Björn, Benny, Agneta and Frida. And I'm now pronouncing it in the Swedish way. And those are tongue twister pronunciations, uh, some of them. Completely impossible. It's just, it's not a practical name. So Stig Anderson, he, got, you know, he soon got tired of having to say all those four names every, every time he was talking to the media or he was talking to other people at the record company about the group. Um, so just for fun, he just, you know, uh, switched their names around the initials. He took the initials of their first names and it became ABBA, ABBA. The only problem, of course, was that in Sweden there was a canned fish factory, really well known, who already had that name. They were called ABBA. So when he suggested to Bjorn and Benny that they should be called ABBA, they said, well, you know, I don't think it's a good idea that if people think of canned fish when they hear our music. Um, but Stig argued, well, that's only Sweden, you know, it's a great name. And no one could really think of a better name, so eventually Stig prevailed, and uh, there you had the name ABBA. So Ring Ring may have been a groundbreaking recording by Swedish standards, but unfortunately in the Swedish selections for the Eurovision Song Contest, there was an expert jury who didn't really like this song very much, so it only finished third in the selection, so it didn't go on to Eurovision. And the ABBA members and their manager Stig Anderson, who was a really hot-tempered person, they were, you know, disappointed and angry. But, you know, they licked their wounds and set their sights on the following year, when they had an even bigger song, an even better song, maybe, uh, in Waterloo which they submitted to the 1974 selections for uh, Eurovision and they won by a landslide and so they finally had what they had been working towards for so long a ticket to the world stage because Eurovision the Eurovision Song Contest had you know uh, millions of viewers they put on their crazy costumes and performed this song with gusto uh, it was completely different to anything you'd heard in Eurovision before and they made a splash, they won the entire competition and Waterloo became one of the biggest hits internationally that year. So they had achieved what they set out to do, to let the world know there is a group called ABBA and they can make good pop music. And if you really want to understand ABBA, you you really have to read this prehistory of ABBA because the ABBA story doesn't start with Waterloo. Um, there's, you know, all these things going on, all these musical influences, all these different types of music that they were doing, success and failures leading up to this magic moment. And you can read all about this in Bright Lights, Dark Shadows, the real story of ABBA, written by me, Carl Magnus Palm, and published by Omnibus Press. And, of course, the book, I mean, I'm only scratching the surface here because the book features the rest of the ABBA story, all the ups and downs, uh, the successes, the failures, um, everything that happened on a personal level. Um, and when you have read this book, I feel confident that you will understand ABBA better and you will also realize what brought them to where they are today when they're making a comeback, uh, their voyage, if you will, uh, to their album, their comeback album, Voyage.